Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Shidong. My, uh, I'm the account manager for Cell Signaling Technology. First, I want to welcome everyone to today's CST Learning Lab live session. Um, today, I'd like to introduce uh, one of our production scientists, Dr. Shikhan Subramanian, who is also one of our Western Block scientists at CST. Uh, we're going to discuss um, a couple of uh, key aspects of a successful Western blot experiment, and then mostly focus on uh, how we approach protein expression and PTM detection. Um, please keep in mind that during today's session, you will always have the chance to ask questions. Simply use the go to webinar question section on your panel. You can type in the question there, and by the end of the presentation, we will be able to address your questions. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us, uh, welcome to CST Learning Lab live session again. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our uh, Western Block scientist, Sri Kong. Thank you all for joining. Sorry for the technical difficulties. So I'm just going to give you a brief outline of my presentation and topics that I'm going to cover today. A brief Western blot introduction, know and understand your target, what to keep in mind when choosing the proper sample, tools to determine protein expression levels, post-translational modifications or PTMs, our Phospho-Site Plus site, and then I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. So Western blot can be summarized in a few steps. Gel electrophoresis, followed by protein transfer, either wet, semi-dry, or dry. Antibody binding, recognition, the primary antibody and secondary antibody. And then finally, detection, either enzymatic or fluorescent. These are the basic steps in Western blot, but I'd like to take it back to step zero, choosing the optimal sample for your Western blot experiment. These are some of the general sample considerations that will not be the focus of my presentation today. We have several great links to, on the CST website listed here that discuss these and other web, uh, Western blot related considerations. If you've never worked with a particular antibody target, please start with the supplier's data sheet. Antibody suppliers painstakingly make a lot of validation data available. Use the website and the data sheet as a resource. CITAB is another place to start. It's a life science data provider that curates antibody and reagent information, combining market data and specific product citations. And of course, there's PubMed. If you aren't using it already, it's an immense collection of more than 30 million citations for biomedical literature. We often get asked, where else can I find antibodies? So BioCompare and these other sites are popular resources. In regards to knowing and understanding your target, there are, these are questions you should be asking yourself. You need to understand the target protein expression levels in your potential samples. Do you expect to see endogenous signal or do they require stimulation? Are you interested in a yes or no answer? Is it simply, is your protein present or not? Sometimes you're looking for a more nuanced answer. If your target is more localized, like in the cytosol or nucleus, do you need to fractionate your lysate and titrate the sample to tease out the answers you're looking for? And what's the expected or observed size of your target? I'll address the size a little bit later. In some instances, for endogenous or total protein detection, you may have to dig a bit further. Due to the nature of the targets themselves, some proteins require treatment for signal expression. For example, HIF1-alpha is a transcription factor that plays a critical role in cellular response to hypoxia. Untreated cells may not be subject to hypoxic conditions, so the treatment is required to induce hypoxia for detection of this target. NRF2 is another transcription factor that plays a key role in the response to oxidative stress. Here, the addition of the compound MG132 prevents proteosomal degradation. Otherwise, turnover happens so quickly that NRF2 activity may go undetected. Similarly, we have CHOP, which is a multifunctional transcription factor in ER stress response. So stress is obviously needed to detect, to detect signal. To help guide us, protein and RNA expression profiles are available through these sites. BioGPS is a complete resource for learning about the gene and protein functions. 
it supplies human, rodent, and sometimes other models as well. The Human Protein Atlas maps human proteins in cells, tissues, and organs using integrated technologies, and it displays RNA and protein expression levels in tissue and cells. DEPMAP is a resource of data and computational tools to identify targets for therapeutic development, and it's a great source for selecting human cell lines and possible treatments. I've started using this more frequently in my own experimental setups. These other sites here are other popular references. Going back to the target size question, the expected molecular weight is based on the amino acid sequence listed in Uniprot or other sources. And this may not be accurate because it doesn't take into account how the protein migrates on the gel. The listed amino acid sequence also does not take into account the following, which can vary size. Post-translational modifications, or PTMs, refers generally to enzymatic modifications of proteins following protein biosynthesis. To date, there are 18 or so known PTMs, including phosphorylation, acetylation, and glycosylation. In post-translational cleavage, some proteins are synthesized as proproteins and then cleave to make the active form. Regarding splice variants, alternative splicing and isoforms could create different sized proteins produced from the same gene. Uh, for relative charge, this refers to the composition of the amino acids, how much charged versus uncharged amino acids there are in your protein. And there's also potential for multimers, for example, dimerization of a protein. This doesn't commonly happen under reducing conditions, but is possible depending on the strength of the interaction. Listed here are resources to help you navigate these size differences. Obviously, publications is a great source. Unipro provides protein sequence and functional information and Phosphocyte Plus. So Phosphocyte Plus is a comprehensive resource for investigating the structure and function of experimentally determined post-translational modifications in human and rodent samples. So it's actually created at CST, and it's maintained and curated by our own group of bioinformatics scientists. Researchers and many companies around the world use the information curated in this site. You start by entering the protein name. AKT is my favorite, so we'll go with that. So PTMs are listed. You click on the protein in red to get more information. On a side note here, I'd like to point out that isoform expression can vary in tissue. For example, AKT has three isoforms. AKT1 is more specifically involved in cellular survival pathways by inhibiting apoptotic processes. AKT2 is more specific for the insulin receptor signaling pathway. Both of these are expressed in various cells and tissue. AKT3, however, is predominantly expressed in the brain. We'll click on AKT2 because I love the insulin signaling pathway. Now there's quite a bit here and you can totally geek out diving into all of the available information, all depending on what specific questions you're looking to answer. For this example, we'll click on site table. You can see the list of experimentally and computationally mapped PTM sites. We'll focus on phosphorylation, and click on the serine 474 phosphorylation site. So the phosphorylation is an important mechanism by which the activity of proteins can be altered after they're formed. It plays a critical role in regulation of many cellular processes, including cell cycle, growth, apoptosis, and signal transduction pathways. Phosphorylation is the most common mechanism of regulating protein function and transmitting signals throughout the cell. I'd like to point your attention to two useful areas of information, the cells, tissue, and the treatments. All of these are curated with clickable references. We pick colliculin A, an activator, and LY294002, an inhibitor of PI3 kinase, which is upstream of AKT. Timing is critical for the detection of phosphoproteins. Many proteins are dephosphorylated soon after signaling cascades completed. You should leverage known biology or perform a time course experiment for novel systems when possible. AKT is a serine and threonine kinase. Phosphorylation and dephosphorylation occur relatively quickly. The optimal Western blot signal is detected around 10 minutes after treatment. Signal can still be detected after an hour or so, but if you wait too long, say 24 or 48 hours, depending on the specific treatment in cells, the signal may return to basal levels by that time. You'll also notice the size shift with PTMs. Dephosphorylation or, in, or inhibition with LY can cause a slight decrease in size. Phosphorylation or activation with Cal-A can cause a slight increase in size. This is only scratching the surface with Phosphocyte Plus. 
and I'm specifically focusing on sample selection, treatment, and PTMs. The site notes various experimentally determined post-translational modifications. It's important to note that some target sites can undergo numerous PTMs. For example, take histone H3. The lysine 27 is a very active site. It's a means of detecting levels of mono, di, and trimethylhistone H3, as well as acetylation. PTMs are not easy to understand and detect in all situations. What can sometimes add to the confusion is that the same PTM can be visualized in different ways, especially glycosylation. Glycosylation in some instances can be visualized as a smear, sometimes as multiple bands, or sometimes a single band. Here you'll notice the downshift in size when the sample is deglycosylated. Obviously, there are a lot of things to keep in mind, but if you don't know what you're looking for, then you're gonna have a hard time and you may struggle with your experiments. All of the publicly available tools I mentioned are here to help you start your Western blots off on the right foot, along with well-validated antibody products and optimized protocols. So good luck, thank you for listening, I appreciate your time, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Awesome, thank you, Mr. Council, for the presentation. Um, as a reminder here, for all of you uh, who's joining us live here, you will be able to ask questions simply typing your questions in the uh, question part of your panel on GoToWebinar, and we will capture these. And uh, Shrikam is actually live here with us. Hi, Shrikam. Hi. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so we will be able to answer your questions live here. Uh, so let's see whether we have some questions uh, already. Uh, okay, the first question I can see here is, um, what will be... What is the most important things to do and not to do before doing the very first Western blood experiment? So as, as I indicated in the talk, you should know and understand the target of interest. Uh, this will help you pick the proper experimental and control lysate samples to test. You wanna make sure you read the supplier antibody recommendations and follow the optimized protocols. Uh, it's understandable each person might have their own uh, Western blot protocol or lab might have their own Western blot protocol, but at, at CST, we make sure we painstakingly make sure that the protocol has been optimized for the best uh, possible outcome. So we recommend that you follow our recommendations. Thank you. Uh, we also have a question about uh, ponsal staining. Uh, the question is, uh, do you recommend ponsal staining to be used just as endogenous control? So typically, ponsal stain is used before blocking, and it shows total protein transfer. It's not specific to your protein of interest, so it can't be used as an endogenous Western blot control. Uh, depending on who you ask, sometimes it could possibly be used as a normalization reference, but not as an endogenous Western blot control. Thanks. Uh, next question we have is, how can, I, how can I identify unknown protein that's expressed from a CDNA sequence engineered in, with an E. coli vector? Uh, so you would need to purify and sequence the protein, like be a mass spec or Sanger sequencing, and run a protein blast search on your results to see what the target proteins or uh, family of proteins match. And then based on that, you could uh, do the Western blot and see if the samples are what, if they have contain what you think they have. Thanks. Um, we also have a question about fluorescence detection system. So any special considerations that need to be taken into? Uh, so for companies that supply their own specific buffers, I would suggest you follow their recommendations. Uh, for Lycor, if you're making your own buffers, we find in-house that it works better to not add tween 20 in the blocking buffer. Tween in the block can sometimes interfere with the Lycor detection system. Uh, for optimal results using CST primary antibodies, I would suggest following our recommendations for primary antibody dilution buffers. Also, uh, if you're testing multiple antibodies, which is an advantage of fluorescent westerns, uh, you want to make sure that there is no antigen overlap. For example, if you're testing a total and a phosphyl foxo 3 a you want to check and make sure that the antigens don't overlap. Right. Um, we also have a question about the choice of membrane here. So why is there seem to be more background when using PBDF membranes and then for lower uh, for low protein expression in our sample, what should we use and what should we do? Uh, so PVDF tends to have a higher protein binding capacity. 
So because of that, it also offers higher sensitivity. So you're more likely to get higher background noise in your antibody detection with this membrane. Uh, In-house, we use nitrocellulose membranes for almost all of our targets, and it works very well. Uh, the second part was if the, the samples are too minute. So to, to try to concentrate, the, if you can, try to concentrate the sample if it's not already in SDS. Uh, add less SDS volume and try, you could also try more sensitive ECL reagent. Uh, adding more antibody, some people actually do this, uh, it, may not, it may lead to just an increase in background. So I would avoid that if possible, use the optimal solution. Right, thank you. Uh, we also have a question on how to subtract the background from a Western blot when analyzing the image. Uh, so if this, so if you're just, you should check the digital image software. The package itself may have some easy way to deal with the background. Uh, different people, reviewers included, have different opinions, and some would argue that quantifying Western blot data is uh, is not very reliable. If you are looking to normalize the data, if that's where this question is going, uh, the most frequently used method for normalizing Western blots uh, is load using loading control. So you can compare, for example, total AKT against phosphorylated AKT and normalizing against the controls, such as tubulin or histone H3. Uh, it's common to use housekeeping proteins, but you want to make sure that your uh, the specific housekeeping protein is not affected by your experiment. In some cases, they can be. Uh, for example, beta actin levels can be influenced by insulin signaling. Uh, other people have normalized with total proteins, such as Ponso or um, Amido Black. But ultimately, if you're trying to quantify your data, I think the most reliable thing to do is use other supported data and maybe easier to quantify uh, qPCR. Right. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, we also have a question on uh, how to denature the protein samples. Is that okay to do that for 30 minutes uh, in? 37 degrees Celsius. So we, in-house, what we usually do is we denature, so we denature and we boil around 90 to 100 degrees for about five minutes or so. But the SDS, we, uh, you're, I assume the customer is using SDS buffer. So that helped that, and the DTT that's in there helps denature the sample as well and the boiling. Uh, 37 degrees may not be enough for half an hour. I would, uh, I would, if possible, I would change that to 90 degrees or more for a few minutes. But if it's worked in the past for your samples, then that may be product specific and I would consult the supplier. Right, thank you. Um, we also have a question specific to HIF-1 actually, because that's a protein that will get hydroxylated first before it mm -hmm. gets impregnated and degraded. So the question is, is, is it appropriate to use a hydroxylase inhibitor in the lysis buffer to prevent this PTM in order to prevent HIF-1, essentially, during the sample prep process? So, unfortunately, I don't work with HIF-1 on a regular basis. I know enough about the target, how to express signal, but uh, I would refer you to the actual the scientists, the group of scientists that, uh, maintain, that maintain that product and work with those that signaling pathway. So, I, your best resource is actually to go to support at cellsignal.com and reach out to the scientists who maintain that particular target. Got it. So, actually, in this case, for um, uh, the listener who's asking this question, we will uh, capture this question and we will be able to follow up with you with more information. Uh, as Sir Kenz mentioned, you will be able to uh, directly interact with one of our scientists working uh, behind the HIF-1. Uh, awesome, so the next question we have is, what is the best way to expose a blot when you are trying to compare uh, what type and knockdown of a protein? What's the best way to explo uh, expose a blot? Yeah, expose a blot. So I would assume it's a detection step, maybe. Uh, so if it's for, for sort of knockdown versus endogenous signal. Yeah, to compare wild type and knockdown of the protein. So uh, by Western blot. So even for the same thing, just like you're using, if it's for activation or deactivation, if you, if possible, depending on, uh, I know all the samples are uh, crucial. So if you have enough lysate, I would actually split your gel in half or triplicate, depending on the number of samples you have. Then you can divide the blots and half, and some can be incubated with the primary with the um, wild type, and some can be activated with the 
knockdown or in the same samples, but then half can be like a total antibody, half can be a phospho antibody or different antibodies at the same time under the same conditions. Right. Thanks. So the next question is actually regard to detecting PTMs. So how can I distinguish between a smear of a PTM, it's commonly seen, or just a dirty membrane? Uh, so if the, the smear is just in one, it's just in one lane of your sample, it's, it could be PTM. It could also be inherent to the target. So again, for that, I, that, that question is more of a target and product specific issue. And I would reach out to the teams that would be, that manage that product. Okay, so so some, we'll like, like I said in the talk, it's difficult to tell. Sometimes it's a band, sometimes a multiple band, sometimes it's a smear. So if you're unfamiliar with the target, I would reach out to the supplier's team that actually manages that product and that target. Got it. Yep. Makes sense. So basically, it's very PTM specific. Yeah. Okay. So moving on, we have a question about uh, the range of concentration. So what is the best range of concentration to detect a protein on the Western blot? Does it vary a lot? Uh, it can be target specific, but we painstakingly take a, it's in-house valid, we do in-house validation. And all of our validations are based on activity and not concentration. So if we say use it at use an antibody at one to one thousand, that's that that means it's going to give you the optimal signal at that time at that uh, concentration. Excuse me. So concentration doesn't necessarily play into it as well as its activity that we that's more important. Right. Thanks. Um, we also have a question about transfer. So what are the what are the advantages and disadvantages of including SDS in the transfer buffer? So this is optional. Uh, like in grad school, I used to add SDS into my transfer buffer and at CST, we don't necessarily add extra SDS to the transfer buffer. And the, the, it doesn't, doesn't affect it that much at all. It, the, signal, the transfer happens great. As long as you're, uh, you avoid air bubbles, you use the proper methanol percentage if it's a wet transfer, and you follow the recommendation. So it, you don't necessarily need to add SDS to the buffer. Got it, thank you. Uh, the next question we have is, can the intensity of the band used as, uh, be used as protein expression indicator? So the intensity of the band, well, this is where you need to control, what are you comparing it to? So if, you're, if, this, is for quantita if this is for quantitation again, then you'd want to norm you need to normalize against if it's a total protein or phospho against a loading control so and then um, use the algorithms and the programs to do that to normalize it so if you see a strong signal uh, on one day and your protein your parameters are also different so you want to make sure that your experimental protocol exposure time everything is as uniform as possible so but the best way to get uh, to do that is to actually uh, normalize against control. Right. All right, so we have another question actually about PTM. So in performing a Western blot, how would you determine the specific location of the PTM if there are multiple sites for a given PTM? So if there are multiple sites for a PTM? Mm -hmm. So we, you can, we have, uh, so we have motif antibodies that you can test if you're looking for just general phosphorylation and you can see a lot of the phosphorylation sites that come out. Uh, if, if you're just looking to see how, how much phosphorylation in a particular sample, but if you're looking for a specific target, um, a lot of PTMs are difficult to detect at specific sites based on the confirmation. So uh, a lot of times there may not be an actual antibody available to uh, detect a specific site. But we right. do have motif antibodies to, if you're looking for just phosphorylation in general. Right, thank you. Uh, our next question is about blocking. So uh, choice of blocking buffer, dry milk or BSA? So in-house we use milk to block all of our targets, both uh, total and phosphorylated. Because there's, uh, there's more proteins of varying size in milk, so you're gonna get rid of the more nonspecific backgrounds. There are papers out there that say uh, that um, phosphatases in milk could disrupt phosphor signal. We don't see that in-house at all because we do so many westerns on a daily and weekly basis that we make milk constantly. So if the milk has been sitting around for a week or so um, then or longer, 
then there's a greater chance for phosphatases to interfere with your signal. But uh, in-house, we don't see that at all. And we block with milk for everything. Right. Thank you very much. And we also have a question. So do you have any tips for detecting high molecular weight targets in general? So if it's a standard wet, um, you can vary the concentration of your gel. So you can, if it's a very high molecular weight marker, you can try to do a 3 to 8% twist acetate gel or even just a 6 or 8% standard gel. Uh, let it run longer, obviously. You want to let it run for, instead of for half an hour or 40 minutes, you probably probably let it run for a couple of hours. And then when you transfer, if it's standard wet transfer, you can decrease the percentage of methanol. This R standard is 20%. You can decrease that to 10 or 5 or even 0, depending on how how large your protein of interest is, and then you transfer for longer for depending. So if the protein is 500 kD, you probably transfer for like four hours on a standard wet transfer. Got it. Thank you. Um, the next question is: uh, So I recently found that adding 1% BSA to the 5% MUC in TBST blocking buffer, uh, that's as per manufacturer's instruction using TBST. Uh, improve the result of the Western block with fewer non-specific bands. Uh, so why is that? So uh, I can't actually comment on that because we don't do that in-house. Uh, it may it may work well for you, but uh, in-house that's not our practice. So if we recommend an antibody to as a primary in BSA, we recommend we you'll get the stronger signal in BSA. Sometimes we recommend primary antibody dilution buffer as uh, using milk. It's almost like uh, you're hedging your bet. You're putting both in there and hoping for the best. It could also be target specific and product specific. So uh, if it works well for you, I'm not going to discourage it. But uh, we can't. We don't. We don't do that in house. So we we couldn't support that if you were having issues because you were adding both. We would recommend that you add the recommended one that was uh, on the data sheet. Right. Thank you. Uh, next question is: Is the use of twin twenty in the membrane wash buffer okay at all? Or were you referring to just use that in the blocker, but no tween 20 in the washing? Machine? So that was for Lycor. So the tween, the tween 20 in the in the block actually interferes with the, like can interfere with the Lycor detection system. It doesn't affect, it doesn't interfere with the antibody binding. So we find in-house in occasion, depending on the target as well too, if you're using a light core detection system and you're not using their specific buffers, if you're making your own in-house, uh, it's best to not use tween 20 in the block. Blo uh, tween 20 in the primary and secondary, there's no issue. Got it. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Our next question is, sometimes the protein of interest from the mouse cells shows at a different molecular weight than the human samples. Uh, is this to be expected sometimes? It, that's again that's target specific and occasionally it can happen that way we do that we see that sometimes too like in, it happens in tissue a lot so sometimes the protein sequences might be a, a slightly different in size or there could be different ptm locations so it is it's possible but again it's target specific i don't want to make a generalization that it, it always happens it's just it's target specific it can be target specific right thank you uh, our next question is, do you have any general recommendations around the amount of protein to load in gel uh, or performing antibody titration when opt optimizing your Western blood problem? So for uh, protein concentration, we recommend using 20 to 40 micrograms per mil in each well for cell lysate, but for tissue lysate and for primary cells, we recommend 50 to 100 micrograms per mil. So if you're not seeing signal in tissue, uh, if, if possible, if you have enough signal, we recommend you add more. Uh, and if you're using recombinant material, obviously you use much, much less. So we say five to 15 nanograms. Got it. Uh, next question is transfer method. So which transfer method is preferred? Uh, semi-dry transfer? It's all. It's up to your preference. Like, which, which, what do you have in your lab? What do you have access to? And what do you like best? So there's advantages to everything. So uh, we use every, we use wet transfer in house. We also use semi dry. We use this. Uh, we use the seven minute transfer system as well. So it all depends. The transfer system is as long as you follow the recommendations. 
uh, it shouldn't make a difference. So it's up to you, to your preference. Got it. And next question is, um, how to choose a suitable loading control uh, for determining enzymes like INOS or COX-2? And um, is it necessary to use sodium orthoven date in the lysis buffer? Sodium. So in the lysis buffer, so are you if the cust are you making your own lysis buffer? Because we have, I think we have sodium pervanidate, I think, in our lysis in the 9803 lysis buffer. Um, again, this is target specific. So if you're looking for INOS or ENOS, uh, depending on what your samples are, if it's in like uh, aorta or tissue or brain, like depend or a cell line. So I would which control to use, you would probably refer to you probably have to refer to the literature and see what they use. Because uh, a lot of times beta actin seems to be the, the default. But like I said, for insulin signaling, beta actin can be influenced by that. So you might not want to use that as your control. So usually histone H3, it's pretty fairly commonly used. Uh, it's a possibility depending on uh, what you're what you're working with. But again, that's target specific issue. And if you have any questions, please, uh, I think, Contacting us via support at cellsignal.com for those specific targets is going to be your your best bet. Got it. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. Uh, so the question is, um, do you agree with starting gradient gel for the first time of a target? Uh, we we use gradient gels in house, like the 40 to 20 percent gradient gels. Uh, we use them quite frequently. It's uh, if you've never used it before, but you should be aware of what size your target is or what your target is. Like that was the part of the talk that you have. You should you should go in with some experience of, or some knowledge of what your target of interest is. So if it's if it's large target, if it's a small target, a 40 to 20 percent gradient gel or gradient gel in general is that it works well for most gels. So it's not it's I wouldn't I don't know if it's a starting point, but it's a great way to visualize your product. But I would look into the literature and to the product to see what the size of your target is. Got it. Thank you, Sir Kans. So I just want to uh, wrap up here and then let everyone know that for all the questions that we're we don't have time to address here, we will capture them and reach out back to you uh, uh, and then provide answer for your questions. So stay tuned for that. And uh, to echo our Sir Kans, in many uh, experiments, it's really target and antibody dependent uh, at CST. When you come to us, we will have uh, the product scientist who's specifically working for those products and antibodies to uh, provide the answers for your questions. So you can always welcome to reach out to us. With that, I'd like to conclude today's webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us and thank you Srikanth for being our uh, presenter today and answering all those questions. Hope everyone have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.